Okay, recording is on. Let's take a moment to pray and then we will get started. Can somebody pray, please? Father God, we thank you for this time and thank you for this morning. And we pray and we submit Pastor Ashish and all the students into your hand when we are going to uh, learn from your word. You reveal through your Holy Spirit. You guide us, you lead us by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being in the class today. Um, we didn't have class last two weeks. So I hope you still remember what we've been studying <laughs> in this course. Um, yeah. So a week before, I was in Jamshedpur. Um, it was nice because um, the, the, the past uh, couple who went and started the work in Jamshedpur, they, of course, the history they they actually attended a short term bible college uh, that was being run um, in tamil nadu uh, by um, one person who i knew in those years this was back in the 1980s 1990s in 1990 i taught in that short term bible college and this pastor was in class he was in that class um, so of course i didn't know because there are so many people uh, in that in that thing, and I taught two subjects there. This was 1990, and uh, so you know, they went back. They start. They went to Jamshedpur. They started the work there. Then many branch churches started. So they had churches in other towns. Then they they reached out to tribal areas and all that. So that pastor still remembered, you know, attending that the class in 1990. Uh, so they reached out um, and uh, they uh, you know, they invited me. So the, this is an annual conference where they bring all the churches, all the people together. Yeah. Uh, I think for me it was so touching to see the fruit. Because I knew that short-term Bible college that, that somebody else was running, where these people had come and attended. And now to see the impact of what had happened here in this place in Jharkhand state. So many other lives from, you know, from one couple who went and started a church. Now it's, I don't know, many hundreds of people, including tribals. Uh, so for me, that was very touching, you know, just to know the history and see what has happened. And uh, so generations now, uh, the sun has taken over and the church is going on and all of that. So it's very touching to see uh, what had happened. Yeah, so anyway, I, I was there for three days with them. Did um, Basically, t we t the theme was on um, abiding in Christ, abiding. So from John 15, talking about that. So I did a seven, <laughs> seven se sermons on that. Uh, like, Nasik was... Uh, was more, um, it was Nasik, uh, it was organized by about 20 pastors, local pastors, the gathering. Uh, they had all the church people, other pastors, all them. We did Code of Honor. Uh, we did that in Nasik for two days. I also went and saw ABC Nasik. Uh, again, it was very touching to see that because Rajesh was, he came and studied here uh, at ABC Bible College. Then he went and he started ABC Nasik. And, uh, you know, to see how God has lifted him up and now the very thriving church, doing very well, strong community. And uh, also he's being recognized as a leader in Nasik. I mean, of course, there are a lot of other pastors and leaders. But, you know, for him to be recognized and so on, it's very nice to see how that work is happening. So that was last two weeks. <laughs> it's good. All right. Let's um, move forward here in our course. We're pretty close to finishing um, our, our course. Uh, let me see. Share the entire screen. We, um, 
we were doing um, biblical understanding of suffering. Did you hear the pre-recorded thing? Yeah. Okay. Any? Okay. If you have any questions, you can ask uh, the class. So I'll just quickly review um, that um, this whole area of suffering is is a very uh, you know it's a very I should say the word touching or you know it's a very painful topic because suffering is real. People are going through these things, right? And we can't uh, just give, I'll give chapter and verse and go be happy. <laughs> we can't do that, you know. People are going through difficult things in life. And so while we want to be having, we want to have a clear understanding in our minds why there is suffering. Uh, at the same time, when we speak to people, we have to speak to them with a lot of, Compassion, with a lot of empathy. You know, we can't just say, "Yeah, I'll explain to you very clearly <laughs> why you are suffering." <laughs> we can't do that. It's not, uh, you know. So it's 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 a very difficult subject and topic as well. But what we have said so far is, when we approach the subject of suffering, we must first of all understand the heart of God. And the way we can understand God's heart is, how did he start everything? And how is he going to finish everything? Right? How was it before sin came? How is it going to be when there is no sin and there is no devil? That will give us a correct picture of God's heart. Right? That will give us a correct picture of God's heart. And once we understand God's heart, then we have to come from there. Right? We don't want to compromise who God is. Now, don't change who God is. Right? Uh, come from that place of, okay, this is who God really is. And this is how, what he has taught us or shared with us in the Bible. About what his original intent is. How is he going to keep things in the future? So what is he doing now when yeah, suffering is real? We are going through it. What's he doing now? And how should we respond to it? So we went through that. Uh, we recognize that suffering is a present reality. Uh, we understood that when God created the world, there was no suffering. In the new heavens and new earth, there will be no suffering. That's how he started. That's how he's going to take it in the future. So that's the heart of God. A world, a place without these problems. Then we said, okay, what are the different reasons for suffering? We have started, we started looking at this. Number one was um, the suffering due to the bondage of corruption. That means all of creation was subject to corruption at the fall. Corruption means it's a deviation from God's original design. Yeah, that means originally God designed everything perfect. But things started deviating, going away from that original design. That's corruption. It's being corrupted. It's not the original. It's not the way God wanted it. And there's a bondage of corruption. That means all of creation has been put into this bondage of corruption, into this place of being in subjection to corruption because of the fall. Everything. So you think about weather conditions. Cyclone, earthquake, volcano, tsunami. Oh, is God create? Is God doing all that? No. Even the natural elements are in bondage to corruption. They've gone away from their original design. So you're having all these things happen. Now, in in the in the case of God's judgment, that is an extreme place where if God is going to judge somebody, he may use this natural elements but that's not his uh, normal thing not every morning he gets up and says okay through these people tsunami these people will get on these people <laughs> that is not god but on the earth things are happening why because these natural things have gone away from their original design when you think about 
uh, uh, babies born with problems. How do we answer that? On the one hand, we say God created, God formed, but then the baby is born with problems. So how do we match that? In what way is God forming the baby in the womb? God put in place natural processes through which babies are being born. Right? So that means he put that in place. That's a creative work of God. Where he put the natural process through which human beings, animals, plants, everything, they create or they reproduce. The natural process is put in place. But we also understand the natural process is deviating from its original design. It's in bondage to corruption. So natural process is happening. That was created by God, designed by God. But that process is in bondage to corruption. It's going away from the original. So then we have all these problems happening. Can we blame God for it? No. God's original process was perfect. But because of sin, it's deviating from its original design. And then we have these problems. In addition to that, there is the devil working and causing problems. That is a second separate point. But in bondage to corruption, you understood what, what the Bible is saying, right? But the Bible also says there will come a day when even creation will be set free from this. That is where in the new heavens and new earth, there will be new heavens, new earth. There will be an earth where everything is perfect. No sin, no sorrow, no pain, nothing. That is Revelation chapter 21, 22. Right? Everything will be perfect. You with me so far? Yeah. Number two. So this on page 81. Second reason why we must, uh, you know, suffering happens is there is suffering due to one's own action. I mean, see, if I am not careful, uh, I will face some problems. I can't blame God for it. It's my action. Hmm? If uh, somebody is driving very recklessly, very rashly, some accident happened. Oh, all things work together for good. <laughs> to those who love God, you should be driving carefully. <laughs> you know, we will we quote nice scripture and <laughs> we say, oh, um, no. God can teach us from our mistakes. <laughs> we will learn not to drive it actually, hopefully. But to turn our irresponsibility as a work of God, no. We have to say, I was irresponsible. I made the mistake. I can't blame God for this. I was not driving carefully. I made the mistake. I have to go and, you know, you know, uh, sort out whatever the consequence is, you know, uh, and take care of it. Like that, there's so many, so many things, right? So, the Bible teaches us, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that is what he will also reap. Whatever a man sows, that is what he's going to reap. So, don't fool yourself. Don't, do not be deceived. So don't fool yourself. What you sow, you'll reap. If you sow to the flesh, you'll of the flesh reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, of the spirit you will leave, reap life. So what you sow, you will reap. That is a law. And that is a consequence for all people, believers and non-believers. So if a believer is a farmer, he goes and sows some seed, you know, example. He goes and... I know what seed, I don't know much about farming, but <laughs> he goes and uh, puts seed for some vegetable, tomato. Ah, that's simple. <laughs> he puts tomato seed. He's going to get tomato. 
he can't say i am a believer i put tomato seed brinjals will come you know <laughs> no, no. you are a believer you believer and non believer whatever you sow you will reap the same law applies for everybody right? now may believer can believe god saying that you bless my sowing but the law is what you sow you will it's true for everybody so we must understand you know sometimes people are suffering of their own act because of their actions so somebody is smoking cigarettes somebody is drinking alcohol they hear, uh, damage their body then they can't say god is teaching me a lesson no <laughs> you should have learned the lesson long back not to hurt your body like this right so we we have to be careful um and uh, you know even uh, godly people made mistakes abraham david they faced the consequences you know so even godly people just because they're godly doesn't mean yeah they escape they godly people love god they did wrong things they faced the consequences but this is where mercy comes the mercy of god what does the mercy of god do the mercy of god lessens the effect of what we are supposed to receive in his mercy he does not give us what we deserve so in of receiving full of the wrong i have sown god you know in his mercy he reduces the effect of that it's okay i'll be merciful to you that's the mercy of god um so when we make mistakes god yeah, he gets us out of the problem he, we ask, we turn to him we repent and in his mercy he forgives he brings us out he helps us you know but uh, the consequence we face but you know god is there to help us the third thing and we're going to spend a little time here so any questions so far on the first two points let me see online Yes, uh, Nikhil, go ahead. So, uh, Pastor, as you said, like uh, there will be new earth and new heaven. Yes. So uh, that means uh, God will destroy this earth. Yes, yes. But when we see in Old Testament, uh, Noah's time, there God say, I won't destroy this earth. Like it's talking about only for water or like. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So he said, after Noah's flood, he said, "I will not destroy the earth in this manner with the flood." So how is he going to do it? Second Peter three with fire. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Huh? He says everything will be burnt with fervent heat. So Noah's was a little mild. <laughs> Second Peter chapter three, when God is getting ready to make new heavens, the new earth, He's going to destroy everything with fire. Nothing will be left, literally. And new heavens, new heavens. Think about it. You no, know? new heavens means this whole universe. It's so big, but God is going to take it all off. New heavens. And new earth, everything will make new. So it's going to be big. Yeah. Yeah, Pastor. When uh, the first point, when I heard about babies, you know, I heard people talking like, okay, something must have happened, but God is in control. No, He's a sovereign God. Or when people are sick, not due to drinking or any any mistake from their part, always heard like, okay, this has happened, but God is sovereign. Why can't he stop it, or why can't he do something about it? Keep mm, hearing mm. this these questions. Mm. That's a valid valid statement. What you have made. So, how do we understand that? Um, on the earth, there is corruption. So there is sickness, and even good people, like you're saying, uh, they've not done anything bad. Right? They're not no smoking, no drinking, nothing. They lived a normal life. Uh, they will face sickness. Why? It's there in the earth. It's there. 
But that is where faith comes. God is sovereign. That means he is ruler over the sickness. Sovereign means he's ruler. He's king. He, he is ruler over the sickness. That means he has complete authority over this sickness. But God has decided, as we see in scripture, that he will intervene in our affairs in response to our faith. That is how he is, it is put it plainly. He is sovereign. He has absolute authority over the sickness or the problem, whatever it may be. But he will intervene in response to faith. Now, there is the providence of God. Providence means God says, whether you have faith or not, I will do this for everybody. Example, he makes the sun to shine on the good and the evil. That is the providence of God. He makes the rain to fall on the good and whether you have faith or not, whether you're good or bad, you will get sun, you will get rain, you will have the air to breathe. That is God's providence. That means he's providing this for everyone, whether they have faith or not, good or bad, he's there, he's providing. So in the providence of God, there is the natural healing process for everybody. So, so he has designed our bodies in his providence that when we face sickness, our body, body automatically works to heal itself. That is God's providence. That means through the providence of God, healing is actually available to every person. But there will be some conditions where this natural healing is not enough. Yeah, that is when either we go to the doctor or you have to have faith in God for him to exert his sovereignty and heal us from there. So that is where God has made the provision through the cross of Christ saying, I will work in your life. I've made the provision already. Oh no, I want you to have faith. And when we have faith in his provision, we can experience his work. But that faith, again, is for every, uh, it is uh, for every person. We all have to come the same way through faith. Believer, <clears throat> general, like if it's a, he or she is a non-believer, they don't know about Jesus or they won't put their trust in the Lord. Mm, and mm. whenever we say no, this is okay, or they just be very angry. Like, how can if God is sovereign and why me? I have done nothing wrong. The other person at least done something wrong. I am like a better person. That's their perspective. Mm. Then why me? Yeah. So um, that is where we have to help them understand that God is a good God. You're not suffering because God put it on you. But God is a good God, and you can come out of this suffering through faith in God. God can help you out of this suffering. So God is uh, not against you, but he's for you, and you know he will bring you up. So even through the non-believer, we can encourage them to have faith in God, to believe God, to come out of that suffering. Yeah? Uh, but that requires helping them understand that God is a good God. He's a healing God, delivering God, providing God. And then how to have faith through Jesus Christ. Usually anything happens, uh, I mean, everybody blames on God. God did this. Anything happens, it's like God. Any bad thing is God. Mm. So somebody said, no, no, it's not God. Like they look at you, you have any problem? <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah, I think like when we are believers also, though, so what what uh, we are discussing is God will intervene in our sickness or in our things in accordance to our faith. Yes. So, uh, but we can see so many believers, uh, they have been praying for many years for their sickness, but they are not yet 
delivered or got healed so mm. we have a complete faith on him like i mean according to the scriptures we should have faith in accordance to our faith only god will work god is a sovereign god he can do everything but but how come uh, being as a believers having faith mm. yeah see um the correct thing for us to do is to look at each situation uh individually you know why and uh, then we will find out you know what is it that is holding the believer or keeping the believer from receiving the healing yeah in the particular case for example the believer may say i believe in jesus and i'm believing for healing but they probably are hoping not having faith hoping means i hope one day i'll get healed that is hope there is something maybe god will heal me one day but faith is different right faith is i know the work has been done it is my right and i believe by his stripes i have been healed i'm taking it by faith so many believers are most likely in a place of hope not a place of faith ah so hope is you start with hope but you have to come into a place of faith hmm faith is the substance of things hoped for you hope for it but now you've come to a place of faith where faith says i have it hope says i will have it sometime faith says i have it it is the evidence of things not seen faith is now hope is in the future so that's what i'm just giving some examples of what could be problems so that is that many believers are in a place of hope not a place of faith and so and they confuse that they think hope is faith hope is not faith hope is future i know one day i'll be well yes of course all of us will be well one day when we get glorified bodies but faith is different right faith is now that's one problem another problem could be that we say we are believing god but maybe we don't actually know the words right we are in a system of religious belief so we know what to say i'm believing god but are you really established in the word because faith comes by hearing the word it's not by just being part of a system where you know the right things to say right? that's like that could be right? i'm not saying this is these are problems with every person i'm just saying you know different people are in different uh positions places spiritually sometimes it could also be that unforgiveness hinders us you know because when jesus taught us about receiving from god in mark 11 22 23 24 25 he said you must forgive so us forgiving others positions us to receive the blessings of being forgiven if i don't forgive then i will not receive the blessings of being forgiven i can be forgiven but i won't have the blessings of being forgiven because i have not forgiven other somebody else and jesus put it there in mark 11 you know have faith in god the mount faith will move the mountain faith will receive answer from god but you have to forgive so sometimes people hold unforgiveness in their hearts and that could be a hindrance they have faith but unforgiveness is blocking so like this you know uh, different situations we don't know all the details for each person as uh, so if you spend time with the individual will be able to help them personally and uh help them the really suffering due to bondage of corruption uh you you spoke about this uh, uh natural phenomena mm. it's mm. actually because of uh, this uh they they lost their actual design right? design yes so how how would it actually happen i mean how to actually explain it can you explain how it actually lost yeah. how did it actually happen 
Honestly, I don't know. Like, I mean, the Bible doesn't tell us how it actually happened, other than Romans 8 says that all of creation is sub was subject to corruption. And God did it not willingly. And this was not the will of God. But he did it in hope. That means with the expectation that one day he will redeem it back to himself. Right? So temporarily he let creation go and become subject to corruption. He allowed that to happen. Not because it was his will, but because he knew that he will redeem it all back to himself. How did... Technically, how did it happen? We don't know. We can imagine, but that's just imagination. Right? For example, I've heard some preachers or, or read, um, they say, when in these cancer cells, so what are cancer cells? These are cells that have gone, again, they've gone away from their own, that the correct uh, way cells should function. Now they've just, you know, uh, multiplying, randomly destroying the body, so on. So I've heard some, sometimes say there's a spirit of cancer. And the spirit of cancer is what is driving these cells to behave that way. That's what a preacher said. There's no chapter and verse for it. Other than we know that there are spirits that cause sickness, that affect parts of the body, you know, hearing, hearing, or so on and so on. We know that spirits cause sickness, we know spirits, they're spirits of infirmity, but is it, is it accurate to say that the spirit has gone into the cell and it's causing the cell to behave like this? There is no way to prove it, either, yes, or disprove it. Right? So I think it's just left to somebody's imagination. We don't have chapter and verse to explain how it happened. Uh, the only thing that scripture tells us is that creation has been subject to corruption. So it's gone away from its design. Talking about like the other point also you mentioned, like it's not because of any individual. If some earthquake uh, happened in this Bangalore, I mean, that doesn't mean the people who are living in Bangalore did something wrong and against God. Mm. So when we are taking this point subjected to corruption, nature, mm -hmm. so that that literally, not like literally, somehow it will mean like the, who, I mean, how it actually got subjected to corruption is because of something which is in nature. Because of sin. Because of sin. Mm. So uh, nature itself can't do any sin, right? The people who, who can do sin and... And maybe we can take in that way, like I, one of the pastors, was, uh, I was, I heard like uh, the people who are in bank, if, if earthquake came means it was subjected to corruption means the people who are in that Bangalore or in the nature did some sin because of that, it was subjected to the, uh, some uh, consequence or something like that in that. I mean, I'm not taking it a literal mm. meaning and all, but but somehow it will mean like that only, right? If so, we have to go back for, to Adam's sin. That's when everything started, right? I mean, Adam sinned. So all of the earth was entrusted to Adam. Adam was submitted to God. Adam sinned. That means all of the earth went into the hands of Satan. From that moment, something happened to everything in creation, including Adam's body. Started decay. So God never intended Adam's body to die. But from the time he sinned, his body started decaying. Right? And you find that good people and bad people suffer the effects of bondage of corruption. Good people also, right? When an earthquake happens, in a, in, a, in a certain place, there may be churches there. There may be believing communities there. They're all, they're all affected. You know? uh, why? When a famine happens, for example, there was a famine in the Bible. 
The church, there was a church. The church was in Jerusalem, but they went through famine. Why did the church in Jerusalem go through famine when they were actually in the middle of revival? Right? So people were, you know, we can't say they were like sinners. The church was there in Jerusalem, but in Judea, but they were going through a famine. So like that, um, the bondage of corruption affects all of humanity in whatever form, whether it's in sickness, natural calamities, other things. But this is where God steps in to reverse these effects. Like a man is born blind, Jesus heals him. What's he doing? He's reversing the effect of that bondage of corruption, how it has affected this man's life. When you you and I when you're praying for a sick person, we are refer, reversing the effect of sickness and disease, the effect of the bondage of corruption, or it may be even demonic. We are expelling that evil spirit. Which one? The natural phenomena. It is a natural phenomena. But not designed by God. But, uh, it's because of the people who did sin. That's why they faced that whole city. But that was God's judgment. Yeah, judgment. So now, if we take this one, uh, there, there, there is a question that arises: What is the meaning of uh, taking this bondage of corruption? We can say it like a. Uh, it's a natural phenomenon because of the maybe some changes in earth or something. It's because of, I mean, there is a question that arises like so this. So the problem with saying that is then we are saying God created a faulty, there's, there's a fault with God's creation. If we are trying to leave out bondage of corruption and just saying it's natural, then we are saying God did not create things properly. Which is not true. When God created, He created everything perfect. So all the natural systems were perfect. All the natural processes that God created were perfect. They wouldn't cause any harm or inflict any evil. But then why are these natural processes in a place where suffering happens? Um, then then we say, okay, it's because of the bondage of corruption. Right? All right, there's a some comment on the chat by Prabhu Manikam. When someone receives or achieves something good, we say it is by God, but something bad happens to us, we say it's my mistake and blame ourselves. As believers, we see it and understand it in a spiritual manner, but how to answer unbelievers when they question us? Um, yeah, so when something good happens, of course, if we um, we have a part to play in it. It's not like we never did anything, and we have a part to play in it. But it is God, God's blessing, because you know the blessing of God. Proverbs ten twenty two, the blessing of God. It makes one rich. It brings the good goodness, good things of God in our lives. So God is a good God. He's putting these good things in our lives. So we have a part to play, and God has blessed us. When bad things happen, we know that God is not the author of evil. So that's what we say. You know, we can't say God is doing that bad thing. Right? So. We have to look for, okay, why did the bad thing happen? Maybe we are responsible, maybe the devil is responsible, maybe other people are responsible. So we have to understand that. Um, now, to explain this to an unbeliever, to explain this to uh, a non-Christian, I think we just have to focus or emphasize the nature of God. That the Bible says God is a good God, and God is not a bad God. Now, example, in, the, in a Hindu perspective, 
in the Hindu perspective, God can do good and evil. You know, God is light and darkness, so to speak, because they have so many gods. And in that way, for them, God is a source of good and evil. He does both good and evil. But in the Christian perspective, God is light. There is no darkness in him. God is life. There is no death in him. The God is truth. There is no error in him. So God cannot, there are things God cannot do. God cannot lie. God cannot sin. God cannot hate. Right? So that's the difference, a big difference between the God from a Hindu, Hindu perspective and a God from a biblical perspective. So we have to say, so when, when we say God blessed us, it's because God is completely good. He is light, he is truth, he is righteousness. There is no unrighteousness, there is no darkness in him. So in our minds that's very clear, but that may not be so in the mind of a, you know, a person from a different faith. Um, and, and so we need to draw that distinction. I think if we help them understand uh, the absoluteness of God in terms of being light, in terms of being good, in terms of being truth, then they're able to see that bad things, darkness, evil, is not God is not the source of it. Otherwise, by default, in their thinking, their gods are the source of both good and evil. I hope that helps. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Let's take this forward. Suffering number three. Suffering due to satanic oppression. Now, it's very in Job. It's very clear. Job was a righteous man. He was a God-fearing man. He worshipped God. And then it's clear that Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and he started causing all these problems. So it's very clear that it was the devil who was causing all these bad things, all kinds of calamities, destroying Job's houses, Job's family, Job's children, finally Job's own help. So Satan was doing it. But Job did not know. Job didn't know that. He didn't know what's happening in the spiritual world. He's thinking, I'm a God-fearing man. Huh? House fell down. People came and took away my this. My children are not there. All those things. What is happening? I'm a godly man. I'm a God-fearing man. I'm following God. Why are all these bad things happening? And Job's response Two things, very interesting. Job says, the Lord gave, the Lord took away, blessed be the name of the Lord. But did Job say the right thing? That's the question. Right? He said a good, he said a good thing, meaning, oh yeah, God gave, God took away. That's what he said. But is it the right thing? Who was taking away? Not God. The devil. You know, Job, the Lord gave, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. No, 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 Job, no, no, God is not taking from you. The devil is taking from you. God gave to you. The devil is taking away from you. Right? So that statement of Job is actually wrong. But we happily quote it. The Lord gave, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. No, God didn't take away. Right? It's the devil who's taking away. So Job's statement is actually wrong, but he spoke out of ignorance, meaning he didn't have the revelation. He didn't have the understanding that you and I have of the spiritual realm, of what was actually happening. So God didn't say, hey, you know, God didn't immediately reprimand Job. Job was speaking out of ignorance. His statement was wrong. But life went on. The devil continued doing this. But another interesting thing that we see in Job is, Job also said, I think it's Job 3 and verse 26, the thing that I greatly feared 
has come upon me. Job 3, verse 26. So, why did these things happen to Job? So, Job was a godly man, true. He loved God, true. But he also had fear. How do we know it? He said it. Job 3, 26. The thing that I great... Oh, 25. Sorry. Job 3, 25. For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. Ah. Fear and faith attract things into our life. Faith gives God an opportunity to work. Fear gives the devil an opportunity to work. So Job was a godly man. He feared God, but he also had other fears. He feared that all these bad things will happen. He dreaded. So I don't know how, in what way this must have affected his life, right? Like, man, I hope uh, my, I hope nothing happens. Yeah, I hope nothing happens. I hope not. And it could be that this fear also drove him to pray morning and evening every time for his children and his business and family and everything. But he's making a confession. The thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. Right? So, in Job 121, he said, You know, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return there. That is correct, Job. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. That is not correct, Job. <laughs> the Lord is not taken away from you. Right? But it's okay. We know you don't have the revelation. You didn't have the Bible. You don't know what's actually happening in the spiritual realm. Fine, that's how you're thinking right now. But the nice thing is, he said, blessed be the name of the Lord, which means that his heart towards God is, God, I am still blessing you. you know? So that's a good thing. That no matter what I'm going through, God, you are worthy to be blessed. You're worthy to be praised. That's a very noble thing. But this, the, 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 the thing that kind of helps us understand why things are, why this must have happened in Job's life is Job 3.25. The thing that I fear greatly, I greatly fear this, it has come upon me. So this is why we must not have any fear. We must have faith in God. God will protect me. God will provide for me. God will keep me. That is faith. But when we don't are not in a place of faith, we are and in a place of fear, then fear opens the door to all these things. Fear opens the door. So think about this. Job was a very, um, we would say, a very devout man, but he didn't have faith. He was a devout man with a lot of fear. Fear of all the bad things happening in his life. And when it actually happened, he said, Oh, I knew this was going to happen. But Job, that is not the faith. That is not you how you should have been. You should have faith that the God I serve will protect me. The God I believe in, the God who has blessed me, will also protect me and keep. That is the faith you should have. Okay. Well, let's pause here. We go for the tea break. And we'll come back after that and take some questions as well. We'll be back in 10 minutes.